Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so I will just really quickly dive right into it because I have it really long. There is a lot of stuff going on in Microprofile right now. So just quick show of hands, how many of you heard about Microprofile? Yeah, a lot. And how many of you actually tried it? <laughs> okay, free hands. <laughs> so at least you will have something new to learn. So just quickly about me. My name is Martin Stefanko. I've worked in Red Hat, in uh, ByteFi, and JBoZ AP application server. And for the last year or so, I also am an uh, active committer to Microprofile. You can find me on Twitter. So uh, to start, why Microprofile? I would just say how the enterprise Java look like in the past 20 years. What we had was Java EE currently called Jakarta EE which is a set of 34 or 20, 35 specifications aiming for web development in Java. What was the major problem with these specifications is the really cadence uh, that they did in the past decade or so, which were around three or four years for a basic release. Uh, around uh, 2014, I think, containers and cloud came, so we in a community decided that we need to do something about it, that we cannot wait for the next Java EE release. And that's why a group of uh, vendors like Red Hat, IBM, and Tommy Tribe got together and created a new initiative, put it under Eclipse project, and basically aimed it to create an open source specification for optimization of Java microservices. These are all really nice and fancy words, but what it really is is, again, a set of specification. Currently, we have 12 of them, which where some are adopted from uh, Jakarta EE and some are added uh, as brand new. This is the latest release from October last year, where you can see everything, basically, that is comprising now the microprofile. Oh, sorry. Uh, there is also a lot of topics currently under discussion from once, uh, just to mention some examples. We are working on distributed transactions based on Saga pattern, uh, reactive programming, uh, service meshes, as was the previous talk, or con microprofile concurrency. There is a really broad community of people who are contributing to microprofile, and there is also a lot of implementations that you can currently choose from. To name some differences from Java EE, we are trying to do, well, trying, we are doing everything open source and in open ways. So that means that everyone can be heard. Every decision is being made in the public forums and everyone can be part of the uh, overall decisions. Code first approach means that every specification that is to be included in microprofile needs to first have a working TCK and some implementation that is passing this TCK. That it is a different concept from reference implementations from Java EE, but it, there needs to be some working code first. And we are doing currently three releases per year in this mentioned in months. And in two and a half years since Microprofile started, we did already six releases. So you can see the difference from Java EE. Currently, the next release is planned for February 6th, I think, so in two weeks, Microprofile 2.2 will contain, again, a bunch of updates and including a new APIs. Everything that I talk about so far is available on microprofile.io and much more as blogs or videos, so please go and check it out. What I will try to do in this presentation is to show you each individual specification and just to give you an idea how you can use it in your Java microservices. For this reason, I created a simple uh, application where we have three services. The first one is profiling, which is based on Thorntail, which is Red Hat offering of microprofile. Second one, membership, is based on Payara Micro. And the third one is based on uh, Open Liberty, which is offering from IBM. So with her, without further ado, let's start with the whole bottom row as this specification comes from Jakarta EE. I suppose that most of you are already familiar with them, so I will just really skim really fast through them. So JAXRS, Java API for RESTful services, is basically a way how we can define REST or HTTP endpoints in web applications for the past several years. All you need to do to define such endpoints is to really create a class that extends a JAXRS application class and annotate it with application path. 
the value that is provided in this annotation is then used as a root resource path which is prepended to every resource that you create. To create an actual resource, you need to do two things. Uh, add add path annotations, which specify the individual parts of the path that you specify your individual resources, and add some add HTTP methods uh, annotations that will specify what HTTP method you need to invoke on this resource. In that sense, when you access, for instance, here slash API with post HTTP method, you will get invoked that log even method. I hope that you can see it. JSONP or JSON processing is a specification that allows you to work with JSON documents in Java. Basically, all it is is this single JSON class which provides uh, factory methods for each individual sub functionalities of the specifications. In this example, we are creating a really simple JSON document with a build up button. Except for creating and reading JSON documents, it, you are also able to do parsing uh, depending on events as you are going through your uh, JSON documents or make pointers directly into the nested structure of your JSON document and change or patch these individual parts. JSON B came into existence, or JSON binding came into existence because JSON parsing miss a really important feature and that's mapping of Java classes directly in JSON objects as is shown in this example. So JSON binding really does only this one thing. It contains two classes, uh, which is JSON B builder, which can be used for configuration of the document that you are going to output, which may be pretty formatting, for instance and JSON B class, which only contains two JSON and from JSON methods where you can transform directly Java class and its JSON representation. However, I don't really think that you will ever be using this directly, but you will be using it every time you specify consume or produce. This will specify content type and accept headers in your HTTP invocations and you will return directly some classes. So the framework in the background will automatically marshal and unmarshal uh, your uh, classes to JSON documents. CDI or context and dependency injection is basically a way how to put together all of the individual parts of your application and frameworks in a declarative manner. So you only need to specify what dependencies your class require and you will get them injected with add inject annotations directly into your runtime. The runtime then guarantees you that this object will never be null and you can directly use it in your application. The runtime knows what kind of object to inject uh, depending on the, uh, of the type of the object that you are injecting. Like for instance, here we are injecting client object. However, you can have a multiple beans that are able to be injected into a single type, and for that reason, you can also use a CDI feature, which is called qualifiers, which are custom annotations that you can also include on bean definitions and on injection points to specify which instance you want to inject. This will be useful as we will be coming to make a profile specifications. So how you can define a bean, it's in two ways. You can annotate it with uh, some scope, the most useful uh, ones are request scope and application scope. And this basically just define the, how long the bean is going to exist. Request scope will create a new bean for each individual server request. There are also other scopes that you can use, but I will only mention the dependent one because this is the default one and it just says that the bean has the same scope as the bean where it is injected. So it can change depending on where the injection happens. The other way how to create a bean is by produce annotations which can be placed on a field or in a, on a method where you can do any additional custom configuration that you may need for your object to be returned and then this object is returned. So this would be everything that I have to say to the annotations that we took from Jakarta EE. And let's dive into a, a specification that we edit on top of that. Configuration 1.3 is really a way how you can extract uh, your configuration away from your application to be able to change it dynamically. And this 
change needs to be reflected in your running application without the need of redeploying. How you can do this is again by a CDI injection and a custom qualifier, which is called config property. This uh, annotation has only one required field, which is the name of the property that you are going to look up, and it also can have some default values. And then you can directly use it in your code. Easy as that. There are three different ways how you can inject configuration in, into your application. The first one, if you directly use an object, you will need to somehow specify this value. So if you don't specify the default value and you try to deploy this application without required property on the class path, you will get an exception on the start. The second one is injecting an optional value. That means that then you can get optional empty. And the third one, which is most useful, is uh, CDI provider, where each time you are accessing this always reloaded property, the runtime will reload this property from uh, your, your configuration. So this is how you can actually update dynamically without re repackaging uh, and redeploying your application. The specification also allows you to inject directly a whole configuration in a config class where you can call some get value, get property names, and something which is called config source. And config source is a location where the runtime is going to look for your configuration. By default, there are three default config sources. So where we look first is system properties. If the value is not found there, we will look into environment properties. And if we are not successful, we will scan every meta inf microprofile config properties file on the class path. However, the specification also allows you to define your custom uh, config sources, which can be, for instance, config maps or in-memory YAML files, etc. So how you can do something like this is really easy. You can just implement a config source interface, which except for a really uh, de facto default methods which you need to implement, like get value or get properties, you can also override something like get ordinal, which is priority of your config source. For instance, this value means that it will be loaded even before system properties. And you can optionally avoid, uh, override the name of this config source, which will be then look, uh, used for some logging purposes. If you need, again, to some dynamically configuration of your config source, so for instance, you need to open the YAML file somewhere and find, find it somewhere. You can do it by implementing a config source provider which has only one method which returns a collection of uh, the config sources that you want to use. Like this. The last feature that I want to talk about in configurations are confronters. So far I only showed you the string injection, which is straightforward because all the properties are defined as strings. But this conf uh, configuration spec also requires you to define, uh, each implementation needs to define some default conveyors, which are shown on the left-hand side, and also its uh, unboxed variants. And from version 1.3, it also requires you to be able, by default, to parse some collections like array, list, and set. Uh, the default delimiter for these collections is commas. But what happens if you want to inject your custom type, type, which is not known to the runtime? The specification also allows you to do that. And for this reason, you just need to implement a converter interface, which takes the type of the object that you want to actually transfer. And in the, its convert method, you can do your individual splitting of the string property and returning your object. So this would be everything that I had to say to config. And let's move to Health check. Health check came into an existence because we are targeting microprofile for the cloud providers. And if you are familiar with Kubernetes and its liveness and readiness probes, this is the basic concept how you can tell from the application if the application is running or not. Microprofile health aims to be compatible with these cloud providers. It needs to be machine to machine understandable. That means that it needs to map to some default protocol, which for now in Kubernetes at least are response codes. And it should provide enough information for the human administrator. We will get to that, what that means. So to define your custom health check, you really need to, again, implement another interface, which is called health check, and mark it as CDI bin with add health qualifier. This 
is a functional interface that only contains one method, which is called call, and it returns a health check response. This object has a really nice builder interface where you need to specify two required properties, that is the name of the health check, and its final state, which is a Boolean up or down. It also provides you uh, utility methods, which are dot up and dot down. And additionally, you are able to specify with, with data uh, uh, method also some custom key value pairs that you want to include in your health check. This is that information that you can add on top of the basic machine to machine understandable responses. So the human administra administrator can, for instance, in a case of error, find out what actually happened. <coughs> this configuration is then uh, available at slash health endpoint, where you will by default get a JSON document which contains two fields. The first one is the global outcome of all the checks that are included, and the second one is the array of checks. On the right hand side, you can see the same check that we defined on the previous slide with all the custom data that we specify with, with data. And that would be it to the health check interface. And Basically, we are halfway through, so there, are there any questions so far? Yes. <laughs> uh, is the health endpoint uh, world readable, or is, uh, is the specification saying that it should be somehow bound to the local interface or something? I don't think that I understand the question. What is uh, the question is, if the health endpoint can be read, uh, can be uh, requested by the whole world, Yes, this is by default exposed at slash health. Anyone can call it. Okay, so if there are no other questions, let's move to metrics. Metrics speaks for themselves is a way how you can define custom application metrics in your application, <coughs> so you can then collect them somewhere. Uh, the metric specification specified three different scopes of metric. The first one is base, which is something that each implementation is to provide. Then there is a scope of vendor, which are optional vendor-specific metrics. And then what is really important for the end users is the application scope metrics, which are something that you define in your code. Here is just for a general knowledge a list of all the base metric scope where you have like really generic stuff as uh, heap memory, thread counts, or GC times. But what is really nice about this specification are the application metrics with our custom metrics, which are specified by you as a developer. So on this slide, we have an example of two of them, which first one is time. Again, it speaks for itself. It just measures the time in the, your specified units of the execution of the method where it is placed. <coughs> The second one counted, again, just counts how many times this method is invoked. So we already covered time and counted, but there are also annotations for gauge, which is any custom metrics that you want to use. This is the only required one for you to specify the unit in what it is measured. Metered is used to measure the frequency of request of some invocations. So how many times per some time unit you are invoking a method. And at metric is used to inject the whole scopes or the individual metrics as objects through CDI injection. I have an example on this slide where we are injecting directly a counter. And this just means that we, need, we as the developers are then responsible to increase it or work with its value. This metric will still be included in the general metrics that are collected. Uh, there are also other objects for which there are no annotations like histograms and something else, but you really need to have a use case to use such kind of metrics. Again, similar to health check, we have a single endpoint where all the metrics are exposed, slash metrics, but the specification also defines that you can then work with paths and select individual scopes and also access individual metrics. If you are accessing individual metrics, or basically all of them, uh, two HTTP methods are supported. The first one is HTTP GET, where you actually get the value of the metric. And the second one is HTTP OPTIONS, where you get all the metadata that are associated with the metrics, which usually is type, unit, and some description, and name. 
However, you need to explicitly ask for a JSON format, as this was shown on the previous slide, because by default, slash metrics will output something like this, which is a format that is uh, unique to Prometheus. And Prometheus is a set of or a software toolkit for collecting of the metrics and easy queries on them. So if we add metrics to our application, we need to run somewhere and Prometheus instance that will periodically ping slash metrics in, uh, endpoints on each individual microservice. And we also added a Grafana, which is a graphical dashboard for Prometheus metrics. And in that sense, you can easily spun up something like this where you can see, for instance, even health check or number of requests to membership service. And with that, I think that I'm finished with metrics and let's move to Open API. Open API is, a, or MicroProfile Open API is a specification that is based on yet another speci specification which is called Open API version 3. And it just provides a Java or enterprise Java binding to annotations of this Open API standardization into your MicroProfile applications. It is based on the annotations from Swagger, if you are familiar with it. And basically, it outputs a really generic format which is really easily readable both by machines and by humans, so it's used by many companies like, on this, like you can see on this slide. If you just include uh, Open API uh, implementation on your class pad, you automatically get an Open API document exposed on your slash Open API endpoint which is really basic without much information, but it can be useful to someone also. And then you can start augmenting your implementation with Swagger, oh, sorry, Open API uh, annotations. And there are really around 30 of them, so I will just really mention some of them, where you can specify, for instance, title of your application, version, and contact information, or the servers when you intend your application to be run. On individual endpoints, you can specify the name of the endpoints, some descriptions, and what is very useful is that you can specify API responses. That means that you can add descriptions to return codes or response codes that are being returned from your endpoints. You can also specify what is the content that uh, will be produced or is intended to be accepted. After you do all of this, you will get a really nice and long document with all of the stuff that you configured. But what is really nice that this is Swagger compatible and you can easily create an UI, which is really simplistic, but it serves its purpose. And if you are not skilled in front end, you can get a really nice clickable interface with just uh, Maven dependency. So this would be open API. Are there any questions? Okay, so let's move to another simpler one, but really important, REST client. REST client is a specification that aims to provide a type safe REST client on top of JAXRS that you can directly use in your applications. What does it mean is that if you are familiar how REST client invocation look like in JAXRS, it can be something like this. I am doing here a really simple uh, check of the status if we get the valid response. And what REST client allows you to do is to reduce this to this. It's really not easy as that, but this is eventually what it boils to. This is a normal JAXRS resource definition, as we saw when we were talking about JAXRS. And how you can define a REST client is basically to create a really similar or the same interface as this one and just add a single annotation register REST client. This annotation is used so your runtime actually knows that it, this interface shouldn't be parsed as JAXRS resource, but as a REST client. In this example, I am also registering a custom uh, uh, provider, which is something that is, again, uh, special to a MicroProfile REST client, and we will get to this in a few slides. So how you can use this, uh, then this interface in, in, is in two ways. You can directly inject it with at REST client qualifier, and then you can directly use it in your code. However, you are required to specify what is the intended target or the URL where you expect your service to be exposed. And this is done by a microprofile config property, which is fully class classified class name, slash mprest, slash URL, something like this. 
The other way how to specify it is by a REST client builder where you are required to explicitly specify the URL you are using. So just to get back to the provider that I mentioned two slides back, uh, REST client provides something which is called a response exception mapper, which allows you to map HTTP response codes directly to some exceptions that are going to be thrown in a method invocation of the client. It needs to be a JAXRS provider and it needs to override two methods. The first one just says which HTTP uh, response code should be mapped by this mapper. And the second one actually transforms the response or the response code into some exception that will be thrown in, uh, in the uh, method invocation of the client. When we put all of this together, we can basically mask or make a transparent that we are using REST on the background because if we make from a client invocation to a server, if the response is successful, we are transforming some POJO with JSONB into JSON. On the other side, again, with JSONB, we will deserialize the JSON into POJO. And if some uh, error happens, we will be throwing exception <coughs> on the server. This will get mapped into response code, and the same response code can be again mapped to the same exception on the client. Any questions? Okay, so let's move to JWT. JWT stands for JSON Web Token, and it's a way how you can do authentication and authorization in your microprofile applications. This is again based on a different standard or specification that is supported by many companies, which is called JWT. And basically, what it boils down to is the usage of tokens or security tokens. We don't really have a space here to go how JWT works on the background, but there is a really nice presentation from David Blevins from Tommy Tribe on this topic. So if you are interested, there will be a link to the slides at the end. So if we want to authenticate the user with our application, we have for this reason a user service which is using only basic authentication and other services are using JWT. So if user wants to get a token, it needs to first authenticate with the user service, which in turn returns back to him or her a token. I also provided an examples for all of the stuff that we will be doing from now on, but I don't really have a time span here to go through all of them. So if you are interested, please be sure to check them out after. The JW token that is returned is base for 64 encoded string, which is containing three parts delimited by commas. And the first one is header, which basically contains only the type uh, of the authentication, which here is JWT and the used encryption algorithm. The payload is defining a set of claims, which is basically only thing that you are interested in JWT. This is key value pairs. And the third part is the signature of the token, token issuer. This is a decrypted version of that payload part where we can see the set of key, value part, uh, key values pairs where uh, this means something to the, the service that are going to authenticate the users. Microprofile JWT only specified that you need to specify two required claims. The first one is UPN, which is uniquely defining the user or the principal. And the second one is an uh, array of groups, which will be directly mapped into Java security roles. In your application, then, you can, I also included here, for a good practice, specify this in OpenAPI. But JWT is really this, where you have a custom annotation login config, which is used to replace login configuration from web XML if you are not using web XML. If you are, this uh, security configuration will take precedence and declare roles that are being used in your applications. On your individual JAXRS resources, you can then directly, again, open API where you can directly reference the specification from the previous slide. Direct with JWT, you can directly specify the roles that are allowed to access this method. If they are not, you will get back a 401, unauthorized. The only thing that is missing right now is to how to specify a public key on individual services. So for instance, profiling is able to decrypt the token that is reserved, rec received from the user. And this is again done by integration with microprofile config. 
And there are two ways how to say, uh, specify it, directly with public key property or with public key location, which can be a file or a, uh, URL. So in that sense, if our user already has a token, it just sends it to profiling, profiling will decrypt it, verifies that the user has a role that is able to access the re, uh, resource, and he or she has, it will re return the data. Again, I also provided an example for this, but I don't have time to go through that. What is really nice to do about JWT is that this token can be passed you know, through the chain of your invocations, and each service on the path is able on itself to decrypt the token and verify the claims. This is something that is really nicer than other ways of authorization and authentication because you are not required to do any additional traffic just for, to authenticate the user. And this would be everything to JWT. And let's move to open tracing. Open tracing is a specification which is used to track the request in your distributed system. So basically, you will include some identification into your request and you can see which services are actually have been included in the processing of this request. This is particularly useful if you have hundreds of services, you don't know what, where the branching will happen. So you need to track where the, where the errors are. It again builds up on yet another specification, which is uh, having the same name, open tracing. And there are many uh, implementation or like software that is compatible with this uh, specification. The most used ones are Jagger and Zipkin. So how you can use this in your code, if you just, again, include microprofile open tracing on the class path, you will directly get tracing for each JAXRS method. But this specification also allows you to specify an add trace annotation where you can optionally disable tracking on some met of some methods, or you can also include methods which are not JAXRS capable. By default, uh, well, tracing works with the concept of spans, where span is some basic tracing logical unit. By default, open tracing will start a span when you are entering the method and close it or finish it when you are ending the method. But microprofile open tracing also allows you to directly inject a configured tracer in instance where you have a programmatic uh, way how you can control the spans. So this can be then tied to your business ex execution in your method. And what you will get back is something like this, where you can see what all services actually have been included in the processing for how long. This is a Zipkin console, and this is the similar example in uh, Jagger. And this would be everything that I have to say to open tracing, and let's just quickly move to fault tolerance as a last specification. Fault tolerance is really about providing different strategies to provide resilient microservices. So it provides you different ways how you can handle failure states in your applications. Again, it is based on uh, long years, long year uh, software projects like Hystrix and Failsafe that ha has been used for several years in applications. So it's not something brand new. And what it aims to do is really to create a configuration which would be separate from your business application. So you can do, for instance, timeouts and retries, not in your business logic, but by some other framework. Fault tolerance consists of five annotations representing the five strategies. And let's just really quickly go through all of them. So timeout speak for itself. Again, we can specify an open API. You just provide some timeout unit where if the execution will take longer, like for instance here we have a flag that will time out after 10 seconds, you will throw an exception that will get mapped to 504. Again, we have an examples, but I don't, uh, won't go through them. And retry as a second strategy, again, pretty straightforward. If some service went down and we need to, s some events will come out and we need to call this service, we need to somehow react that we get an error code. So we can, for instance, retry after some delay. In this example, we are also using asynchronous annotation, which is six annotation of fault tolerance, which just marks this method as executed in different threads. This is really important if you are using, for instance, retries. 
So you will propagate the context from the incoming thread to the thread that is actually handling the request. So not you will actually get maximally five retries and not five retries in each thread. Retry annotation, really basic. You will just specify the delay and maximum of retries. Here we are actually calling the membership service. So in the similar examples, we will try again and it's still down. Then it will come up and after delay we will try, we will succeed and we are good to go and return the request. But what will happen if you actually try again and again and you still don't get the, uh, the uh, valid response? So you actually reach max retries. By default, you will throw an exception. However, uh, my core profile fault tolerance also provide yet another strategy how to deal, deal with failures, and this is a fallback annotation, where you can specify a string name of the method in the same class, which will be used as fallback handlers on an implementation of a fallback handler interface, which is again functional interface with one method, where you can do some different or default execution of the request. That doesn't mean that you don't fail, you just return some different, fail, uh, different value or some default value, so the service which is calling you doesn't really necessarily need to fail. You can do here, for instance, some logging, send some email, or uh, in our case, we are actually just send, uh, saving the requested event under a failure index into our Elasticsearch. Again, this example is shown in this GIF. I won't go to it. And the fourth annotation or the fourth strategy is called circuit breaker. A circuit breaker is something which can be in three states. The first one is closed. When the circuit breaker is closed, all you are handling the traffic normally. If some error happens, the circuit breaker opens. And in that sense, you will automatically start rejecting all incoming requests right away. This prevents you from unnecessary timeouts or doing some valuable work which will be thrown away eventually. After some delay period, you will put circuit breaker into a half open state where you allow some number of requests to pass into your system. And depending on this request, <coughs> if they succeed, you will actually open the circuit breaker. If any of them fails, you will keep it closed. So in our example, if Elasticsearch database will go down and requests come, start coming. There is a three second timeout for our Elasticsearch where um, profiling service will, will then timeouts and return an error. So what will happen if events come, keep coming and keep coming? There is no really any reason to actually timeout all of the subsequent requests if we know that probably Elasticsearch is still down so we can directly return an invalid response so fail fast or fail preemptive. The definition of circuit breaker is again with a simple annotation where is a bunch of properties that you need to set up uh, for the circuit breaker. I don't want to go through all of them. You can look it up afterwards. And again, this example is shown in GIFs in this end. And the last annotation that I'm going to talk about today is bulkhead. Uh, bulkhead is a concept from actually boats where each boat is split into a compartments like these ones. So if you actually breach part of the boat, you don't get water in the whole of your boat, only in that part that it was breached. This can prevent you from sinking, just as I know. What really bulkhead is in microprofile is specification how many threads are able to concurrently execute your methods. So if you are able to concurrently handle only two requests, and every other request is rejected until the first request is finished and then you are able to process it again, you can specify it with a simple annotation which takes an integer number of requests that are able to concurrently execute this method. Here is an example using JMeter where we, it is shown that if we try to access it with two, three threads concurrently, we will get back a too many, res, uh, too many request uh, response. And that was the last uh, specification that I have to, for today. So I just a few closing remarks. Microprofile 2.2, this is the screenshot from yesterday, uh, is almost released. As I said, we are aiming on February 6th. 
Actually, even these two specification has been already released, but people are just lazy to update the milestones. And call for action, if you really like what I just showed you and you want to get involved, this is everything evolving right now. So everything you don't like or you want to extend somehow, you can voice it right now. So the easiest way how to do this is by our weekly and bi-weekly meetups, where, which are available at this link in the calendar. There is a meetup for every sub-specification, directly one hour just talking about the specification. <laughs> Every decision is done on these Hangouts or in Google Groups. We also have everything on GitHub, specifications, APIs, and TCKs. And if you are just interested to try it in your applications, you have many implementations to choose from. So what I really want you to take out from this uh, presentation is that if you like what you are doing, uh, what you see, to create a really cloud-ready, resilient applications in Java is really simple, and all you need to do is include a single dependency. So that would be everything for me. If you have any questions, please go ahead. <laughs> so OK. Uh, Not yet, but I know that they already have this idea. Do you have any idea if something like this is being implemented in any other language? Uh, there are other languages or other teams that are trying to include some of these specifications, but it's not that easy to include it directly, as most of them are mapped directly to Java annotations. But for instance, we are more working now on the long running actions, which are distributed transactions. And I know that we already have some node guys which, which would be interested to also contribute. So it's more spec to spec basis. So OK, if there is nothing more, thank you for your attention.